All right, welcome church family and friends. Thanks for joining us, all of you, today through our online campus. It's good to spend some time with you. I want to give a special or an extra special welcome to all you folks at Impact Fairfax and Impact Bethany. I'm thankful to have a little bit of time with you today. This is the third week of our special November stewardship series called Foolproof, and the tagline is how to handle money in uncertain times. The message I've prepared for this weekend is simply called The Foolish Pursuit of More. And right from the beginning, I want to be clear and tell you that I don't believe the pursuit of more, regardless of whatever the more is that you're talking about, I don't believe the pursuit of more is in and of itself a bad thing. I don't believe that for a second. The question is, what is your motivation for the pursuit of more? If your pursuit of more is the belief that it will somehow bring value and meaning to your life, value and meaning that you've always longed for, and I'm talking about value and meaning in the sense of happiness, in the sense of fulfillment, in the sense of self-worth, and you can go on and on, then that's a problem because no matter how much you have, it will never, ever be enough, never. And here's how I know that's true. I know that's true from taking the time to read the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon, who many people think may have been the wealthiest man who ever lived. And more than anything else, Ecclesiastes is a personal journey, or excuse me, a personal journal of what he discovered as he searched for value and meaning in the things of the world. And it was an exhaustive pursuit because he sampled pretty much everything the world had to offer. In fact, look at these words we'll put up on the screen. This is the very first part of Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 10. Solomon writes and said, says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. In other words, he tried everything the world had to offer. But in the very next verse, this is Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 11 now, this is Solomon's conclusion to that pursuit. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. Solomon tried to find value and meaning for his life in wealth, along with many other things, work, sexual pleasure, many other things, but he found out in the end that it was all a meaningless pursuit. Let's say, for example, that you're someone who believes that saving a million dollars will bring life and, uh, or excuse me, will bring some kind of value to your life, some kind of meaning to your life, something you've been longing for your entire life. And so you set your sights on that goal, and you work hard, and you save relentlessly to get to a place where all of your account balances add up to a million dollars. But the problem is, while I'm sure you'll probably feel some sense of satisfaction at having reached your goal, nothing's in change, nothing has changed inside of you. Your life is just as empty as it ever was before. You feel just as lost as you did before. And the reason why is because there simply is no earthly thing that can fill up the emptiness of anyone's life. Solomon discovered that. And he discovered that with regard to money, which is what this foolproof series is all about. That's why he wrote these words in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 10. He wrote, whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. And his conclusion was, like in so many other parts of the book of Ecclesiastes, this too is meaningless. So what I really want to do for a little while today is spend some time talking to you about the foolish pursuit of more. And if you have a Bible with you, I want you to grab it and go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll also put those words up on the screen. So uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's all right. But I'm going to read 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10 as we begin. And I want you to follow along as I read. This is the Apostle Paul writing, and he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. 
People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. We'll stop right there. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about this <clears throat> passage of Scripture. The part that stands out to me above everything else is the very first part of verse 10 where Paul writes and says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And I'm going to focus on those words, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of pull them out of the text and set them aside, and then I'm going to let the rest of the text teach us what we need to do to make sure we avoid making the mistake of loving money. Uh, as I looked at the text, I could find five different things that Paul writes, five different things to teach us how to avoid the love of money. I'm going to go through each one of them very quickly. If you're someone who likes to take notes, then you might write down somewhere this first thing. Uh, first, you've got to pursue genuine godliness. If you want to avoid the love of money, then Paul says you've got to pursue genuine godliness. I go back to the very beginning of the passage, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6, and it simply says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. One of my favorite preachers, and I'm sure many of you could probably say the same, is Dr. David Jeremiah, and he defines godliness like this. He writes, simply put, godliness is living a fruitful, obedient Christian life. It is being faithful to our calling by doing the good works for which we were saved. That's a great definition of godliness. And now, to be true to the context of the passage, we have to understand that just before our passage in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, Paul writes about the truth that there were false teachers who were using godliness for the purpose of financial gain. And they were doing that by pretending to be godly in order to make money. But here's something that we need to understand about godliness. Genuine godliness cannot be faked, no matter who you are, no matter what the setting uh, no matter how clever you are, genuine godliness is not something that can be faked, and genuine godliness will always be its own reward. And so the first thing we have to do to make sure that we avoid the love of money is set our sights on pursuing genuine godliness. Then as we continue to work our way through the text, the second thing that I've got written down here is you've also got to learn to be content. You've got to learn to be content. And again, we just start with 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6, where Paul says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And I'm going to define contentment like this. Contentment is finding joy in whatever God has given you. And here's what we need to understand about contentment in the context of 1 Timothy chapter 6 and this passage that we're looking at to help us understand how to avoid the love of money. Contentment is one of those things that falls into the category of God's ways are different. I hope you're a good enough student of the Bible that you know that there are a lot of things in the Bible that can fall into the category of God's ways are different, different than ours here in this world. And the reason why I say that about contentment is because contentment doesn't come by adding to what you have. It actually comes by subtracting from what you have, which is the exact opposite of what most people believe and think. Here's what I mean. The, the world says, this world that we live in, this sinful, broken, fallen world that we live in, says that you find contentment when your possessions, especially money, rises to meet the level of your desires. But God basically says that you find contentment when your desires lower to meet the level of your possessions. And so that's why I say contentment falls into the category of God's ways are different. Now, I want to be sure and say that this isn't some kind of instruction against having things or having nice things or even having an abundance of nice things. There's nothing in the Bible that says any of those things are wrong. More than anything else, this is an instruction about the truth is about the truth rather that contentment is something that happens inside of you. Contentment is not something that should be impacted based on external things, things the world has to offer. Real contentment is something that happens inside of you. 
And Paul understood that better than anyone. That's why he was able to write these words in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 12. I'm sure many of you have heard them before. Uh, He's in prison when he writes these words. He doesn't know what tomorrow holds for him, and yet he's able to say, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Contentment is not something that's determined by external things or possessions or places or anything like that. Contentment is something that happens inside of you. Then the third truth that I'm going to pull from this 1 Timothy chapter 6 passage that helps us uh, see how we can avoid the love of money is you've got to live with an eternal perspective. You've got to live your life in this world. If you're a believer, you've got to live your life in this world with an eternal perspective. And we just continue to work our way through the text. Now we move from verse 6 to verse 7. 1 Timothy 6, 7 says, For we brought nothing into the world, and we take nothing out of it. And the point Paul is making here is really simple. If we're going to avoid the mistake of loving money, we need to recognize just how temporary earthly wealth is, and we need to focus our attention on eternal wealth. And really, friends, that echoes something Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, and I know these words will be familiar to most of us. Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Our instruction is that we focus on things that are eternal. We focus on storing up treasure in heaven. And we store up treasure in heaven when we treasure Jesus, when we treasure our relationship with Jesus above every other thing in our lives. Because when we treasure Jesus above all else in our lives, then we'll be committed to pursuing the will of Jesus and the work of Jesus in the world that we live in. And we'll see our relationship with him as being the most valuable part of our lives. When I was typing uh, these words under this point in my uh, office this week, I I thought about an old song that I can remember singing in church when I was growing up, and I'm sure it'll be familiar to many of you. How many of you can remember singing these words? I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. That's really the idea behind living with an eternal perspective, which is another thing Paul says keeps us, that keeps us rather from the love of money. The fourth thing that I pull out of this 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 through 10 text that helps us avoid the love of money is you've got to embrace a simple life. You've got to embrace a simple life. Again, we just keep working our way down through the text. You get now to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8. And in that verse, Paul writes and says, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Now, we probably need to talk about this for a minute. Uh, Paul's words there in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 8, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those words don't mean that God expects all of us who are believers to live our lives in extreme poverty. More than anything else, He is just affirming for us the minimum necessities of life, the minimum necessities of contentment. And this is found in other, this this kind of truth is found in other parts of the Bible. This is similar to what David writes in Psalm 37 and verse 25 when he says, I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. The bottom line is, One of the ways we avoid the love of money is by understanding how little we actually need to live. And so this isn't me saying that everyone who is a Christian needs to immediately begin to live some kind of a minimalist lifestyle. It's me saying that everyone who is a Christian needs to remember it doesn't take a whole lot for us to be able to live and to live lives of contentment. And then finally, the fifth thing that I see in this 1 Timothy 6 passage that helps us learn how to avoid the love of money, is you've got to recognize the danger of desiring wealth. And we see that 
finishing up the passage in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul wants Timothy and all of us to understand that the love of money is a dangerous thing because it can cause us to do some very foolish and harmful things. The love of money is a dangerous thing because it can cause us to make decisions sometimes that have the power, literally, that have the power to destroy our lives. Now, I love that passage of Scripture. I love that teaching. I love how clear it is. I love how practical it is. I love the the simple warning of loving money that's found there. But while while I love all of that passage and while I love all of those truths, and they're powerful for all of us, I really want to circle back and spend the rest of my time talking about one of those truths in particular, and that's the importance of learning to be content. Remember we said that if you want to avoid the love of money, you've got to learn to be content. Friends, the Bible has so much to say about contentment. Uh, The Bible has so much to say about uh, the dangers of, of being discontented and pursuing wealth or possessions or any other thing that the world has to offer. And much of it's found in the Old Testament book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, uh, both written by Solomon, who, again, remember, many people think was the richest man who ever lived. And so he wasn't writing about wealth or possessions from a perspective of want. He was writing about them from a perspective of abundance. And what we find in the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes are some specific warnings or dangers that come with a relentless pursuit of more, the relentless pursuit of more wealth, more money, more things. I'm going to run through them and uh, mention each of them with a single word. I guess I probably should have said at the very beginning of this message today that, hey, we're just going to have a Bible study together today about the relentless pursuit of more and the danger that can be associated with that. Because I just gave you five truths from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10 to help us avoid loving money. And now I'm going to give you five things from the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes that remind us of the danger of pursuing money. But uh, it's never a bad thing to study the Bible or to go a little bit deeper in the scriptures. And so just follow along with me today. Five specific dangers or warnings that we need to hear with regard to the relentless pursuit of more. I'm going to name each of them with a single word. The first one is the word fatigue. Proverbs 23 and verse 41 says, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Listen again to the first part of it. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. I don't think that requires much explanation because I'm sure we all know people who have literally worn themselves out in the pursuit of more and more and more money. Maybe that even describes you. But really, it is a foolish pursuit at the end of the day. I love this quote that comes from Rick Warren uh, that I think relates to this uh, because we're all familiar with uh, talking about being in a rat race, you know, in this world, you know, our professional lives, our working lives, the pursuit of more. We've all heard it described as a rat race. Rick Warren says, even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. I think that's something important to hang on to. Nobody wants to invite fatigue into their lives. It's a, middle, it's a miserable thing. I've known people who've spent the first half of their life, especially their adult life, losing their health in the pursuit of wealth, and then they spend the second half of their life losing their wealth in the pursuit of health. And honestly, friends, there's got to be a better balance than that. And so we want to make sure that we understand this danger in the relentless pursuit of more. There's the danger of fatigue. Let me give you a second one. The second word to write down is the word expense. And what I mean by that is the Bible teaches us that the more we have, the more it costs to keep up with it all. Ecclesiastes 5.11 says, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. What does that mean? Well, it means the more wealth you acquire, the faster your money is going to get spent. The more bigger, better, newer stuff you have, the more money it's going to take to maintain that stuff. I was listening to a preacher uh, sharing a message uh, 
kind of along the same line and the same topic of this once, and he said that uh, not long ago he had seen a bumper sticker on someone's car that said, I used to dream of the salary I'm now starving on. And I bet there's some of us who can relate to that. You're making more money today than you ever made before. You're making more money today than you ever thought you'd make in your life. And yet, for some reason, it's not enough. Even though there might have been time you thought, if I could just get to this level of income, then I'd have it made. You get to that level of income, and it's not enough. Last week in my message called A Fool and His Money, we looked at the parable of the rich fool that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 12. And if you remember uh, the parable, there is a farmer who experienced the blessing of a once-in-a-lifetime crop that gave him and his family financial security for the rest of his life. But do you remember how he immediately responded to that blessing? Listen again to verses 17 and 18 of Luke chapter 12. Uh, This is after he got this once in a lifetime crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And that's exactly what we're talking about under this second point of fatigue or this second warning, the second danger of fatigue. The more you acquire, the more money it takes to maintain it. And in the end, it can just wear you out. Let me give you the third danger. The third danger is anxiety. And we'll just stay in the book of Ecclesiastes for that and look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 12. The sleep of a laborer is sweet whether he eats a little or, or excuse me, whether he eats a little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. Now, again, I always feel like I have to clarify things. A couple things here. First, I don't believe this to be an absolute statement in that it describes every rich man. I'm sure there are are wealthy people who are good stewards, faithful stewards of what God has entrusted to them, and they sleep like a baby every night. So I don't think this describes every rich person, every wealthy person, but I'm sure it describes many. And the second one, and I've kind of said this already along the way, this is in no way an instruction to live a lesser life or a minimalist life. It's just a statement of fact. You know, the more you have, oftentimes the more anxiety it brings into your life. I've certainly had lots of times where people have come to me for counsel because of anxiety over the ability to manage or even sometimes just hold on to what they have. And I feel bad for them because the pressure is there. It's obvious and it's taking an obvious toll on their lives. But the truth is many people fall into the category today of uh, spending more than they earn and if, that's, if that describes you, then that's going to catch up with you eventually. The fourth word, the fourth danger is conflict. Proverbs fifteen twenty seven says, A greedy man brings trouble to his family, but he who hates bribes will live. A greedy man brings trouble to his family. This makes me think of a, a verse we just read uh, earlier in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9 says, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. The truth is wealth and the maintenance of wealth can create a lot of conflict in our lives. Probably on more levels than I could even name today. We're all familiar with uh, the truth that a big reason why many couples divorce today is because of the destructive power of money and the things that money can buy and how that impacts their lives, the destructive power of spending and maintaining and on and on and on. And then the fifth word that is a warning to us or a danger to us with regard to the relentless pursuit of more is the word dissatisfaction. Earlier, we looked at this verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 10. Solomon writes and says, whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied, or rather never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. And I hope we all understand how damaging it can be to live a dissatisfied life. I mean, think about a time in your life. I've been many times in my life when I felt some level of dissatisfaction related to any number of different things, and uh, it's, that's miserable. I'm sure you would agree. I love this verse from Proverbs 14 and verse 30. It says, a heart at peace, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy 
rots the bones. You know, sometimes a healthy life is not as much about what you eat, a healthy diet, as it is about what eats you, what's gnawing away at you on the inside. And sometimes that's just dissatisfaction. So what are we going to do? What's the answer to the foolish pursuit of more? Well, the truth is there are a lot of answers, and we've touched on several of them already, but I want to just close by talking about one more answer that I really believe is powerful. I honestly believe in my heart that the single best thing you can do to break the habit or the cycle or whatever it is of the foolish pursuit of more, the foolish pursuit of money, the love of money, whatever, however you want to describe it, I think the single best thing you can do to break the habit of all of those things is making a commitment to generosity, to living a generous life. Now, I'm sure that probably sounds like the kind of thing a preacher would say, but I'm telling you today, I believe that as much as I believe any other thing when it comes to the practical Christian life. And I believe that because I've seen the reality of God's provision and God's blessing in my life and the life of my family over and over again that I believe comes as a result of a commitment to generosity. Generosity has the power to break the power of money in our lives, to break the, the uh, love of money, the, that desire, that, that part of us that loves money. It has the power to break the love of money in our lives. I, I believe in being generous. I believe in the words we've looked at the last couple of weeks from Proverbs eleven twenty four that say, one man gives freely yet gains even more, another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. Let me, just, let me just get real practical for a minute and just close this message by telling you uh, the two most important things that I've learned about generosity over the last many, many years. The first one is this. It's very practical, very pragmatic. First, you will never be generous until you make a plan to be generous. I don't care who you are. I don't care whether you have a little or a lot or you're somewhere in between. I really believe there's great truth in this statement. You will never be generous until you make a plan to be generous. I believe in the words of Proverbs 21 and verse 5. We talked about this in the opening week of our foolproof series. Uh, The proverb writer says, The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. The plans, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. And because I believe that verse, then... I manage or I steward the money that God entrusts to me and my family with a plan. I have for a long, long time. Uh, some, of the, some of the parts of the plan are more detailed than others, but I manage what God entrusts to me with a plan. Uh, we talked a little bit about that in the first week, about how important it was to, to have a plan with regard to how you handle God's money. And I told you that, for example, one of the Parts of my plan is I've never spent more than a certain percentage of my monthly income on a house payment. I I set that percentage with the very first house that Sandy and I ever bought back in Houston, Texas, somewhere around 1983, something like that. It was a a tiny little house, maybe 1,100 square feet, uh, that we bought for $58,500. And I looked at my income, and I said, I can afford this percentage of my monthly income on a house payment, and that's what we did. And that percentage has not changed over the years. That's a part of my plan. I don't go into debt for anything. I've got debt on my mortgage, but it's, it's going to be gone in the not-too-distant future. I don't go into debt for anything beyond my mortgage. Uh, when I came to Mount Pleasant 19 years ago, it was the first time I came to a church that offered any kind of a benefit package along with the salary. One of the things in the benefit package was a 403B. It's uh, the nonprofit version of a 401K. And I fully fund my 403B every, every week out of my paycheck. I fully fund my 403B. I've been doing that for years. Our, our, our medical insurance is a health savings account, which is a high deductible, high deductible insurance uh, a medical insurance account that, that carries with it the opportunity to build money in a savings account, a health savings account. And I 
maximize the amount of money that I can put in my health savings account every single week for my paycheck. I also save a predetermined amount of money every single week in other uh, accounts. I make all my savings automatic because you can't miss what you don't see. I set aside money every week for Christmas presents and birthday presents. And so when birthdays come around and Christmas comes around, it's not a financial uh, burden uh, or hardship to be able to participate in everything to the degree that we want to. I, I commit to giving more uh, than 10% of my income back to the Lord. And every time, every time I get a pay increase, the amount of money that I give back to the Lord increases as well. I could go on, but I'm going to stop right there. I just believe in the importance of having a plan. And I don't think anybody will really ever be generous until they have a plan in place to be generous. I've had countless conversations with people who tell me about what they're going to give someday. But if you don't have a plan to be generous today, then there's a good chance that someday is never going to come. That's why I say you can't be generous or most people won't be generous until they make a plan to be generous. That's a really important truth, and that's something I learned a long time ago. You'll, if you're going to be generous, you need to have a plan in place to be generous. The second thing I've learned about giving over the years is this. You'll never be generous until you choose faith over fear. You're never really going to be generous until you choose faith over fear. It's not just a lack of a plan that keeps most people from being generous. It's also a lack of faith. It's a lack of faith that if you give, if you give generously, that God will provide. But I'm telling you today, folks, if you want to experience the provision, the generosity of God in your life, then you're going to have to exercise some faith when it comes to your generosity. There's a great story in the Old Testament book of 2 Kings chapter 4 about a woman whose husband was part of something that was called the School of Prophets. And sadly, tragically, one day he died suddenly, leaving her and their two sons with nothing. In fact, it was worse than nothing. He left them with debt. And because he left them with debt, some creditors came along and said they were going to take the two sons as slaves to satisfy his debt. So this widow cried out to the prophet Elisha for help. And Elisha asked her a really simple and really specific question. He said, what do you have in your house? You can find this story in 2 Kings chapter 4. What do you have in your house? And the widow said, we don't have anything except a little bit of oil, just a little bit of oil. And so Elisha told her to go into her neighborhood, so to speak, to where she lived, to all the surrounding homes, and gather up as many empty vessels or as many empty jars or containers as she could get. He said, take them back home and pour the oil into those empty vessels, into those empty jars, and when each one is full, set it to the side and then fill up another one. Well, that's what she did. She went out. I mean, I'm sure she was fighting her own... Uh, thoughts the entire time, thinking all I got is a little bit of oil. I don't know why I need multiple vessels or jars, but she went out and she collected as many as she could find. She went back home, shut the door. She's in there with her two sons, and she began to pour the oil into the first empty vessel, the first empty jar. Can you imagine? Wouldn't you have liked to be a fly on the wall when that was happening? Give me a, give me a, give me a jar. No, not that one. Give me the small one over there in the corner. And they set it on a table, and she took the little bit of oil, and she began to pour it. Well, to her surprise, the oil never stopped flowing. And so she filled up the first one, and she said, give me another one. Yeah, give me the biggest one over there. And she filled that up, and the oil never stopped flowing. And that was the case. She filled up every single jar, every single vessel she had, and the oil never stopped flowing until there were no more empty vessels, no more empty jars. She went and told Elisha the prophet what had happened, and he said, now go take that oil sell it, pay off the debt, and use the rest for you and your two sons to live on. Literally said, this is 2 Kings chapter, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 7, the latter part of the verse, he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Listen, 
folks. I am not a prosperity gospel preacher. That's not me. I don't believe in the prosperity gospel. I would never, ever stand up and tell someone, hey, if you sow a seed of $100, which is to say, if you gave $100 to the ministry of our church, then I promise you God's going to sow a seed of $1,000 back in your life. I would never say that. I, I don't believe that's how it works. But I will tell you without apology that you can trust in the promise of God to provide for you, and you can trust in the promise of God to bless you when you make a plan to be generous. And again, nothing, not one single thing will break the power of money in your life, will break the power or the, or the desire of a relentless pursuit of more in your life faster than generosity, faster than a willingness to be generous and to give. And so I'm going to encourage everyone listening to me to put the fear aside and have the faith to trust that when you choose generosity, when you make a plan, a genuine plan for generosity, that God will provide for you and bless you. I can't tell you exactly how it might come, but I can tell you that God never breaks his promises. So one of the things that we do every year in this stewardship series is we have a stewardship commitment card for the coming uh, year. And uh, because so many of our people are worshiping online, uh, then we've got uh, a hard copy and we've got a digital copy. Uh, if you are someone who is worshiping exclusively online, then you can access, access, excuse me, access the digital copy by uh, just reaching out to the service host in the chat room as you're watching online today. Uh, you can find it in the MPCC Greenwood app if you've got that downloaded to your phone. And you can find it uh, on the Give page of the, the Mount Pleasant website, which is mpcc.org. Info for all of you, all of those of you who are watching me from one of our Impact campuses uh, today, in particular Impact Fairfax or Impact Bethany, uh, those uh, hard copy commitment cards will be there at the church. I always distribute them on the third week of the stewardship series. We've got one more week to go because I want you to see it. I want you to pray about it. I want you to really give it some serious thought. Talk uh, with your spouse about it, your family about it. Seek wisdom from God, and then uh, next week we'll be looking for a commitment. Uh, I told you last week's message that God did not create us to be selfish. He created us to be generous. He didn't create us to keep. He created us to give. And the reason why is because God knows that you will never lose a thing by being generous. And so my challenge to all of you today is make a plan for generosity, and choose faith when it comes to being generous over fear. Go ahead and pray with me today. Father, thank you for a chance to talk about this today, and I pray that the truth of your word, and that's all we've really talked about today, is we've just, we've looked at your word, we've looked at it from the Old Testament and the New Testament. We looked at 1 Timothy chapter 6, and those words Paul wrote in his first letter to Timothy, we looked at a variety of selected passages from the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. I pray that all of the truth of your word will penetrate our hearts and challenge our hearts. And I pray that there will be people listening who maybe their entire life have let fear guide them when it comes to being generous, when it comes to generosity. I pray that this might be the year when they would choose faith over fear and experience the blessing that comes from generosity. We love you and we thank you that you're such a generous God with us and that generosity was never on display more fully when you, than when you sent your son, Jesus, into the world to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. Thank you so much for that. Help us to be like you and live generous lives. In Jesus' name, amen.